Welcome to All the Buzz. You may be saying to yourself, what is All the Buzz? Well, we know buzz is what people are talking about, and this show will soon be talked about. But let me give it to you in words. All the Buzz. We hope to promote this show on local Austin television and on the internet. Three little words, All the Buzz. Now, if I might take a couple of minutes of your time, I'd like to explain how I got interested in doing this show. In the 90s, I made a show called Characters. And th though the technology was pr improving and becoming more user-friendly, I found I had to get a large group of people to, to do the shooting, find technical people who could do the editing, and in the 90s, I averaged one show per year of Characters. So I kind of put it on the back burner. But in the meantime, I, I became ever more intrigued by television. A lot of people feel television is something that you go home and veg out on. But my favorite media philosopher, Marshall McLuhan, the guy who came up with several concepts which might interest you, one is called the Global Village. Yes, he predicted the whole world would become a global village, which it has become. His other main concept is the medium is the message. And the key to understanding that is, he says the medium we use is much more important than anything we say or do on it. For instance, you have that iPhone in your hand. You send dozens of texts. You have phone conversations. All of that pales in comparison to the fact that you have an iPhone in your hand. Well, Mr. McLuhan died in 1980, and I feel he figured out this universe better than any other media philosopher since. And interestingly, the academics have a hard time with McLuhan. That's a topic for another day. But Marshall McLuhan said that television is what he called a cool medium. A cool medium is one in which the audience, you, get very involved. You're not ve vegging out. You're working. This, this image, when you watch television, is being projected onto you. You are being x-rayed by the television or the screen that you're using right now. And in the process of that, you're engaging with it deeply. Well, you're saying, that's nice, that's fine, that's theory, John. My name is John Theophanis. I'm the host of All the Buzz. What's the proof that I am uh, engaging so deeply in television? Well, think about this. What, what uh, TV medium has survived to the present day and flourished? The talk show. The talk show has been going strong since TV was invented. We've got Jimmy Fallon, uh, Jimmy Kimmel, Stephen Colbert, Andy Cohen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These shows, and now the other form of interactive TV, which is, is called um, reality te television, it is dominating. Why are we so intrigued by reality TV? Of course, you might disagree with me, Alex. This is my guest, Alex North, first guest on All the Buzz ever. <laughs> but let me finish my lecture here, Alex, and I'll be right with you. Reality TV is so fascinating because it's being written by the performers in the moment. They are talking to each other. They are usually women fighting about things or whatever it is. <laughs> They're trying to resolve issues. And we as viewers, or it might be a, one of those contest shows, American Idol, we are view, as viewers are asked to vote who's the best singer. That's totally interactive. And that, my friends, is the key to TV. So I said to myself, John, when you did characters in the 90s, you were on the right track. You were talking to people. It's live. It's in the moment. So I feel this is the best way. And thanks to the uh, technological advances, and the help of my friend, Cody Davis. We're doing this show much more efficiently and economically. Let me uh, give you the, ma the major players here. Alex North, my first guest for All the Buzz. Alex, thank you for being here. Let me introduce Cody in print. And here's our director of the show, Cody Davis. Cody, thank you for taking on this task, and I hope we have a good time. And I want to touch on one of our major topics with Alex today is going to be Uber. Yes, all the buzz is going to be buzzing about the thing that you're all talking about, because Alex North is an Uber driver, and we're going to find out quite a bit about it. So, Alex. Yes. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thanks Great to have, have you here. Show. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, before we get into Uber, uh, I wanted to mention that you and I met uh, at a talk, uh, public speaking 
environment. Laughing and, matters. Yeah, laughing matters. Toastmasters. We're laughing and number matters. one, number one uh, Toastmasters club in all of Boston. And then that's also where we met Cody. So clearly, you va you value communication. I'm guessing. I value your communication very much. It's a very very important part of my life. And I, I recall in our early days as friends in the club, I was on my way to uh, Montana. Oh, and, yeah. and you were working on a comedy bit because uh, Laughing Matters is uh, oriented toward comedy performance. Oh, yeah. And we worked a little bit uh, long distance. I can't remember the gist of the bit. Oh, yeah. It was, um, could have been a couple of them because I think I ran a couple of them by you. So it was, I ran two of them by you. The, the gist of that one was, the gist of the one that uh, we worked the most on was the Mac versus the PC. Oh, uh, right, right. Bit. So... So are you a Mac or a PC? I, I'm, I've been a Mac for, um, I mean, I, I played on the idea that, in the, in the bit, I played on the idea that since most people were PC users, I just played on that idea that everybody hated the people that were the elites that were using the MacBooks and the, and the Macintosh computer. So in the bit, it seemed like I was a uh, PC user, but mm -hmm. in, in truth, I was a was a Mac user because, you know, part of part of creating the material for that particular bit was understanding, you know, the <laughs> the mindset of the Mac user. Yeah, Macs are kind of snobby. I'm a Mac, I'm a Mac user, so there's something there. You had made your piece that really wasn't your opinion, which makes for the best comedy when you're not really, yeah, uh, concerned about. Yeah, I, I, I just let them have it. I just let the math users have it, basically, in a bit. So what's it like to get up in front of an audience and try to make them laugh? You know, it's the, I, it's the most exhilarating thing that I've encountered in a long time. It just makes me want to kind of do it a lot more. I found it a lot easier to you know, prepare things you know, to make people laugh for me personally than prepare other types of things and I you know generally that's the consensus among our members I think that if you ask Cody or you ask you that even though the idea of, of going up there and presenting a speech that's just information seems a lot easier I think that you know most people that sit down and write a comedy bit um, and present it since it's kind of I don't know it doesn't have to be a structured it has kind of more of a specific goal. It seems to be an easier task for most people to go up there and do three minutes of comedy. Easier task? I would say most people would be frightened to death of that. I don't know. I, th I was just listening to Jennifer Garubi and other people say, and I was kind of surprised, it seemed, you know, that, to try to encourage our club members mm -hmm. to get up there and do these speeches and do these, uh, these three-minute comedy bits. It seemed like... Uh, you know, some people were saying that it, it seemed easier. It was definitely easier for me. Yeah, you, to go you and preferred do a, the smaller do time amount and, and to, the challenge. But the smaller time amount wasn't isn't really part of it. It's just the task it is a lot easier for me to wrap my mind around. So it's just more exciting and it, and, and it uh, motivates me more than the other types of things. Well, I'll tell you a few present. observations I had about you in, in, uh, in the club there. I noticed that I see you as, as a pretty fearless person, a pretty brave uh, person, adventurous, and um, I remember you had, you had uh, relationships with some of the women in the club. I don't know if they were friendships or dating relationships, but you seem to enjoy uh, that, and so you're confident enough to get out there and meet people, date, etc. Yeah. And um, I know you're a dad, yeah. you're, you're a parent, and you're, you're a golfer. I found experience that. Excellent golfer. Oh, thank you very much. I wouldn't go that far, but uh, I do enjoy the game, and I have some good shots. I will admit that. And so you, uh, you also, um, I don't know your entire employment history, but I, I know you've done real estate, and of course the job that we're here to talk about that you've done more, most recently is Uber. Okay, yeah. So, um, so, so shifting over to the Uber conversation, uh, you were the first person who mentioned Uber to me. You had a small car at the time. And oh, I, yeah, and Mazda 5. So how, how did... The how, car you have is important. <laughs> the car you have, explain. The, well, you, you want to you know, provide a... You're providing a service, and your service is your car. So the type of car that you have 
that contributes to the experience that you and your riders are going to be having in your car. So, for instance, as a specific example, you said I had a small car. It was a Mazda 5. It, li it was small. It was a small car, but it, it rode big. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, had, it has uh, three rows of seats. Uh, oh, really? Two, I think it's like a... Two, uh, you know, two real tight beside each other. It's a very interesting car in the sense that it's, you know, developed by Mazda. Uh, on the platform of the Mazda 3, if you can imagine the Mazda 3, which is basically a compact car, they just take it and extend it a few inches and added a third row to it. So you have a car that you know, arrives and people get on board and they see how big it is inside and they get excited about it, about doing it. But now um, you've, you've, to me it seems like you've moved to a larger car, a GMC Acadia, and I presume it had something to do with the economics of being an Uber driver. That's true, that's true. Uber uh, offered uh, type, new types of services that required a, a nicer vehicle to you know, generate you know, more income, basically. So I, you know, I took the dive, I was doing you know, real well with the, with the smaller car, and uh, you know, the margins were getting smaller and smaller. Uh, uh, from them lowering the rates, and so I, you know, I, I just uh, bought something that would uh, generate the, uh, the different types of uh, levels of, that Uber offers. Okay, so there, there are different rates uh, to Uber depending on the car that you summon or hail or whatever it's called? Yeah, I, I mean, people have a, have a choice. They can go super economy with the UberX service, or they, could, uh, they can order a larger car so because they would like to travel with their friends, and that's called XL. XL. Mm -hmm. And then they, they can order a nicer car, um, which would be similar to Uber X, but it's a nicer car. So in other words, it would only, uh, the select service, which is what it's called, it's called select, is offers service for four people. Um, that's all it guarantees. And then, and then they also have one called Lux. So, luxury. Which is which is luxury, which is the ultimate in luxury. So, I basically took their list of cars that they had and, and uh, selected among the ones that would cover all of the services. All the categories. I, I didn't realize at the time that they would be offering a, a luxe service actually, um, but it ended up it ended up being um, a part of the luxe brand. As well, my my particular vehicle. So we're not, you know, we're not here to, as you know, we're not here to promote Uber or anything. We're kind no, of wanting I'm, to. I'm explain. just talking about Uber in my experience. <laughs> but and if Uber in the city of Austin has become a controversial topic, and before we talk about the city of Austin's uh, issues, I'm not an expert on it. As far as your own experience with the Uber company, and is it is it as user friendly as as I thought it is to, to get on with them and have, have, has it been a smooth ride, literally smooth ride for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been a very smooth ride. I mean the history of, of me and what's the general category which is ride share, that's you know the economic term that's been given to a, you know a electronic company like Uber or Lyft or originally I worked for Sidecar, another company that offered this type of service. Um, you know originally um, like, what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's, you know, what's it like being an employee, basically? Oh, getting on, getting yeah. on with the company. So, you just, uh, you, you apply, um, you know, with your car and with the insurance information and they do a background check and make sure that you have all those sorts of things. If you have all those sorts of things, it, it can take a, a short period of time or it can take like a week to get approved. But they're definitely going to go through and make sure that uh, that that you've got the information that they want. And once, if you do, it only it's only basically one shot, especially if you provide all the information up front. And uh, you you've told me that uh, on the way over here that you, you have a classic uh, uh, group that hails you on a Thursday night. Could you explain the some of the challenges of being an Uber driver in in Austin, Texas? Oh, you know, I mean, as thing, you know. It's kind of a, uh, I, I've, I've actually witnessed what happens to these services over time since I've been doing it for such a long time. I've been doing it for almost three years now. Three years, huh? For different companies. And, uh, you know, as time goes on, 
um, first when people experience the service, they're ecstatic and giddy and happy about their experience um, and are expressing that openly. And the that customers. Happens. The customers mm -hmm. are. But as the, the service becomes more ubiquitous and the expectation of it uh, as being there uh, becomes more solid or, or more permanent, that sort of thing, the attitudes of your riders deteriorate. So it sounds time. a lot like a, a marriage, doesn't it? Uh, very exciting <laughs> at the beginning and then uh, you kind of get used to the old familiar and start to find faults with it and it's, bitch and moan. Yeah, it's very, very much like a marriage. <laughs> In fact, there's like micro marriages. Like for instance, the South by Southwest experience starts out uh, like the beginning of the week. People get in, they're all excited and stuff like that. And then by the end of the, the week at South by Southwest, they're just like tearing apart your car. But going back to your original question. Let me interrupt here. I think all the buzz is on to some breaking news. We've realized what the Uber story is. Austin is trying to go on a first date with Uber <laughs> and is being very cautious. They want to know all the conditions. Are you going to get me home on time? What's involved? Do I have to get fingerprinted? Yeah. City councilman threatening to be taken back. Yeah, Petitions. The, big yeah, money. The city council is putting on their, it, yeah, the city council is you know, putting on their chastity knee belt. Like, <laughs> Austin. Uh-huh. They're like, we, yeah. So I, get, I gather you're not a guy that feels the fingerprinting is really necessary. Well, you know, the, the truth is, is that the fingerprinting is, it's not that it's not it, it's unnecessary or it's not that I feel that it's necessary or unnecessary uh, because it plays on the idea of of safety. But what I would say about the fingerprinting is that it's just an old thing, an, an old idea before there was electronics. I get you. Before our information wasn't available in the cloud or you know electronically. So essentially at the time you would put a, a cab driver in a car mm -hmm. and they were on their own. There was no there's no way to track that person or there was no element um, you know they're, they're they're their own car, their own person inside the car, their own satellite and they could do whatever they wanted. So you needed something physical to keep track of them. Oh, those, those are the fingerprints, yeah. So in today's economy, you have, or today's technology, you can, I think you can do the, the background check, and I think that, that Uber and Lyft, the other company that tow services Austin, they, you know, they have pretty much proven that, you know, based on their safety standards that I've read about, that it's okay to do a regular background check, and that's, that's sufficient, plus, you have the other protections in the sense that the company knows who the driver is, who the passenger is, and you know where they they actually went. And so, if you decided to you know do something Bad. negative, mm -hmm. there would be all kinds of, of other to evidence to back up you know the, the story of the other person. Say, so, Alex, before we um, stop our first segment here, uh -huh. I wanted to push you a little bit because you told me a hysterical story once about getting a call, uh, I think it was like a, a fraternity house or something down at UT and there was a little thing going involved uh, boys and girls, young college students and uh -huh. um, they were they were retrieving a friend who was on a date. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean that's one, of, that's one of my favorite stories that I, that I, that I often actually don't tell just because <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of... <laughs> kind of on the envelope I think but I got a I got a request from one of the dorms on probably a Thursday night I don't know which night it was but that's usually when I get these types of requests from fraternity people um, it's a it, Thursday night is UT night and, and I pull up at the Callaway uh, dormitory and these people get in and they're 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 on a mission and they're all excited and it's two girls and and two guys, and they they pile in my car, and they say, "Ow, oh, thank God you're here. You're here. Um, we're on a mission, and 
were, um, you know, this is just this is just like the most important ride ever. And, <laughs> wow, that's quite an assignment right there. <laughs> and and I'm thinking to myself, oh, what could it be? <laughs> and they're like, our friend, and the girls pipe in, and they say, our friend uh, is at this at this house, and I think she's in desperate trouble, and we have to go save her. And I don't know if any of you have uh, have been, uh, you know, had that college experience where the where the uh, sorority uh, sisters gather around their friends to save them um, from the terrible men <laughs> on campus. But I kind of was getting that impression. But she said, "But it, it's deadly serious, and we must uh, go save her. I think she might be in some serious trouble." So, uh, I'm like, hey, I'm your man. <laughs> and so we take off from that house and we head a down. A bunch of girls and guys, right? And you. Two girls and two guys, I believe, is mm -hmm. what it was. And we take off from the dorm and we start heading down Guadalupe uh, north, just a little bit off campus. And we take a ride on 38th Street. And we, you know, you're, we're going down uh, the street where those, you know, we're basically Hyde Park which is a very nice area of town that, that has basically older houses that were built in the 1950s. Very trendy. And, we, and she's, got the, she's got the GPS on or she's got something on her phone and she's looking for the house with the address and we finally get up to the, and we finally get up to that, the address of the house and she's like, oh my God, there it is! That's the house! <laughs> and she said, it's, it looks horrible. She's hor it's horrible. She's in that house. <laughs> and she so she's like texting her friend and she and she tells her that uh, she's outside the house and she says, she says like, "Yeah, she responded. She's in there. She's in that horrible house." You know? And uh, it, it's so dark in there. And um, so we we passed by and I did a U-turn and came back to it. And uh, and the girls the, the girl that's in charge that's going to save the, the girl's life is like, it's there. She's definitely in there. So she comes out. So the girl comes out of the house with this, uh, the, with the, this monster, you know, who's this uh, six foot tall, svelte uh, guy. And she's like, and the girl goes, look at that guy. He's horrible. <laughs> and the, uh, her friend proceeds to embrace and promptly stick her tongue down the guy's throat before she like gets in the car and she's like, get in the car, get in the car. <laughs> and she goes, what are you doing? She goes, can a girl have a little fun? <laughs> oh God. So that went into pretty ha happily as considering what it could have been. It, it was a yeah, nice, it, nice yeah. After, after all of the, uh, after all of the, uh, the, after all the other girls got out of the car, after I went back to the dorm room, um, the guy that was that what told me that I that I was on a mission, he he turns to me and goes, "Thank you, you saved somebody's life tonight." They were still committed to their mission, and they still thought that, that it was a success. I turned around and I looked to the rear of the vehicle, and I said, "Oh look, somebody left their panties," <laughs> and the guy goes. I'll take those. <laughs> <laughs> what a gentleman. <laughs> so your mission was accomplished, it sounds like. Yeah, it sounds like I, I really saved the girl from some fun. All right, well, let's take a break if we could. Oh, it sounds good. How are we doing, Coach?